previously on Fast and the Falcon. Out of the way, spuds. Oh look, part two, the ghost of the potato people. Stay the Survival Podcast, bringing you survival game news. Welcome to the State of Survival Podcast, folks, where we discuss survival games and overall tackle subjects, updates, hot topics, and even give our weird and wonderful opinions about such games. Jarl, what's going on this episode? Well, today we're talking about the complexities of survival versus luxury. Now, I can't speak for everybody here on the team, but I know when Dump and I play survival games, sometimes I'll say, are we surviving or are we thriving? It's generalized as a statement to how well you're doing in a survival game. We've all scraped and scrounged, barely survived, got our butts kicked from time to time. But there are times where you can hit excess food, excess water, and top gear. And that's how you know you're thriving. But do you eat like you're thriving or are you just eating basic canned foods? And that's a question I've always asked until this summer. The Long Dark's latest expansion, Frontier Comforts, changes everything. All right, so before we get to our topic, let's talk about something that I was blessed to watch you and uh, Red Falcon participate in, which was playing on a DayZ server called Willow Glade, and I'd love to hear about your experience with it. Uh, Willow Glade is definitely a very interesting server. It's a PvE uh, kind of uh, difficulty server. I wouldn't say it's completely hardcore, but it uh, it has like its own economy. Its overall strives to kind of replace the elements that you lose when you take away PvP in DayZ and kind of give you other choices, other things to do, which is actually quite a cool and overall endeavor. What did you say, Red? Absolutely. It's a lot of fun. Um, like you said, it's I, I'm in the same mind where I wouldn't call it hardcore, but it's definitely tough. Um, and you you really have to work for for your stuff. So we're we're uh, I think we've got to the progression point where we're setting up a base. We got a flag up starting to try to, to get some storage going. Um, but we definitely had to work for it. So that's been a lot of fun. And we already went through one life on this server that ended tragically with uh, wolves, zombies. And then just when we got kind of situated from that, uh, we heard an incoming gas strike. And that pretty much. Oh, me... no. Yeah. Oh, you man, know, it, it, like. I, I heard Dr. Literally... was talking about the zombies in the game. And that's one of the things that when I was watching the video, I got super excited about. Are the are the zombies harder to kill in that game or in that they server are. or they oh, yeah. they are that's they are. amazing they're, they're okay. actually she's running the mod that lets you uh modify the behavior of the zombies so how hard they are to kill how fast they move uh they do kick down doors and they throw rocks if you do the old <laughs> stand on top of a container and try to just pick them off they'll chuck rocks at you oh yeah and the rocks will knock you out so sometimes you can even fall off a container or a car and you'll just be unconned and then when you wake up they're a thing and the crazy thing is the way she set it up is the military zombies are harder so we didn't really realize this fact fully like we thought that some were harder but they're all more health so after we get done killing the wolves we realize that one of our suppressors broke about on like the one of la <laughs> one of the last or two wolves right so then we start getting swarmed by zombies so we literally are like fighting off the zombies, shooting them, and, like, I'm starting to bandage while Red's holding off a couple more. And then all we hear is a... <laughs> and we both look up, and we don't even say the word run. We just both sprint as fast as we can. And I make it out. Uh, however, Red, having to deal with the zombies, didn't get uh, to run fast enough because he was already out of stamina. So he got um, just barely enough <clears throat> toxin in his blood. And as we were trying to find a possible cure, which is Pox and Daisy, Red, unfortunately, and the funny thing is, is later that day when I logged back in to, like, kind of get away, I also logged into a gas zone. <laughs> no, so no. I also died. 
<laughs> so that was my fault for not living earlier. But it is a really good server for people who enjoy PB and the grind. Uh, folks, I have been playing the game for well over probably 20 plus hours on that server alone. And like Red said, we're barely just getting a base up and going. Uh, you can't sell my, um, stuff in that server. You can do that. There are no cars for you to fix up. You have to buy vehicles. So everything is by foot. So it makes it a little bit harder to get that starting count collateral going. Um, and you can't buy anything unless someone sold it, which is really yeah. cool because it has that true kind of player economy. But it does bring up an interesting point about progression in Daisy itself. And this is something that I actually had a conversation with uh, my friends Lad and Steve from Expansion who makes mods for uh, Daisy and a couple of other people inside of a thing. And we were talking about what kind of progression is too much progression and what kind of progression is good. And I think DayZ, vanilla-wise, actually hits progression really well in the head. You progress to survive in DayZ, but there is a point of progression in DayZ when you're no longer, like Jarl said, living in survival mode. You start becoming living in luxury. And on vanilla DayZ, this isn't a super hard thing to reach, but it is something that most people don't ever truly sit back to enjoy, where they're kind of sitting back, they have plenty of food and everything else. And I love how Daisy makes that a choice. Like, Tizzy is, um, has the gas zones, so does Beloda, and so does the ships. But these are some of the best places to go and loot to find the most best, best military gear. And then the random gas zones add in a little level of difficulty. But these are progression-based things. They don't force you to go to these places to survive. They don't tell you that the only way to play this game is to rush to Tizzy or Beloda and do these missions. And that's, I think, where the progression system actually shines in a lot of these survival games. In DayZ, you're not forced to progression. You are given the choice to. And your choices in DayZ, which is one of the most important factors of it, is what is really cool about DayZ. And uh, it was just an interesting conversation I had with Lad and them because they think that there are several maps out there for DayZ, like Deer Isle, um, Namalsk possibly, and a couple other ones, but they feel like they're being forced to progress through the map's tiers and everything else right. to truly survive, and that's what they don't like about the, those maps. And uh, I've actually heard one of them say they detest one of those maps because of that situation. So it's an interesting fact of kind of what I think we're going to be going into further later is, is progression a good thing or is it a bad thing? And how can that easily be adapted from what we know about Daisy and how they do it for us. You know, what I love about you and Red talking about Willow Glade uh, in the staff chat is that I would be more inclined to build bases in Daisy and enjoy them if I didn't have to build bases thinking, how is some player gonna try to scum their way inside my base? But with the PVE server and the economy, it gives you reason to build a base, but also, you could build a farm and you could be like, oh, I have this water well here. You know, I don't need it here, but this is how I water my plants and gives you that ability to bring out a little bit of designer into it. But I love the idea that you could essentially make a giant agricultural community, sell your food for the in-game currency and then potentially, you know, purchase weapons or items. And I don't know how much food that would take, but... I like that it gives you different avenues instead of having to go to, like you said, Tizzy to get the best guns. It's not the only way that you can achieve them, which is pretty cool. And like you said, you can only buy something if it's been sold. And I imagine that's the advantage of going to Tizzy is selling all the things you get. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dump. I definitely want to check out Willow Glade. Uh, I think that'll be right up my alley, especially with the weird characters that I like to play. Uh, but let's go ahead and move on to our hot takes, find out what all of us yahoos have to say about current topics that have been on our mind. All right, Red Falcon, you're the first one up. Let us know what's happening and happening in your neck of the woods and what you have for us for your hot take. What's been happening in my nape of the neck? Well, just busy, busy work, work, lots of stuff going on. Too, way too many projects stacked up. Uh, as usual, I've oversubscribed myself, so nothing new there. Um, but for my hot take, I wanted to talk about the game Dead Matter and the debacle of their early access release, a little bit about the history and some of my experiences messing with the game. Um, so I 
had I was aware that Dead Matter was being developed. I I kind of saw some of the the hype train videos that they'd shown uh, over time. Um, you know, was was excited for for a new game to come out that was first person zombie survival genre. Um, and so and I really didn't pay a lot of attention to the backstory and didn't dig into it much. It just was like, this looks like an interesting game. And you would have think that I would have learned from uh, the day before uh, to, to dig into these a little bit more, but it was uh, unceremoniously and suddenly released in early access. Um, so I got an announcement because I had it wish listed and said, Oh, I better go grab it. Let's see what this is all about. And I let dump know, Hey, this just came out. We should check it out. And uh, so I went and got it, loaded it up, 145 gig later, um, jumped in, and it was a complete train wreck. It was like oh, they, no. it was like whatever they'd been working on since 2018 uh, had been thrown in the bin, and they'd put together a game over a two week period with scraps. So, uh, and I did a little short uh, video. It wasn't a short, but it was a you know couple four or five minute video with just some comedy clips and some just me making light of the the disaster it was um so looking back at history this is an example of you can have a very good idea you can even have talented developers if you don't have a solid experienced head of studio and c-level executives running the company it can totally train wreck on you so they had um indiegogo kickstarter and then some undisclosed but suspected 10 cent investment um it so it was in oh it is confirmed okay so it was the amounts i'd heard everything from a total of up to nine million dollars invested in this game um over that time well of course everybody goes to what did they do with the money you know did it go to to uh to you know villas and party boats and stuff but the reality is for that kind of tech company over that period of time that really isn't that large of a budget. And especially if you've got a team of 10 or 15 developers making the money that developers typically make, uh, they could burn through that very easily. They could see that. But apparently there'd been a lot of immaturity in leadership. There'd been a lot of turnover. When people would leave, they'd rip out parts of their code and redo it or you know, just not focus on the proper things. Um, so they ended up releasing this thing and then hiding behind the, well, it's early release, what do you expect? And so one of the things I wanted to bring up in line with the progression story is around playability and, and the claim that this game is playable. Well, it does load. You can go in game. Uh, you can fight zombies, sort of. They're kind of, when it was originally released, they were 8-bit Nintendo 64 zombies that didn't move. Um, but there was no story. So even their little prelude story of, well, you're in Alberta, Canada, and, you know, post-apocalypse, blah, blah, blah. But when you think about a game, a game is really a story that your character is the center of. Right. And we go back to, you know, the, the, the campaign mode type games where you're, it's kind of on rails, as they say. And you're you don't have a, you could deviate a little bit, but it's pretty much you're following their uh, scripted storyline, and it's kind of like being in a movie. You have a little bit of control, but in reality, you don't. Um, and then you get the open world stuff. Where how do you maintain that same story where you're the main character of your story um, in an open world? And that's through progression and putting things out there in such a way that you can make choices and it affects your personal story, but it's still very progressive and it, and it continues to move. It's not just you jump in and you kill zombies and that's it. Um, and that's where all their game does right now is you jump in and you can kill zombies and look around and that's about it. So there's no story, so there's no game. Right. Yeah. That's so I'm interested. Terrible. In yeah, with that concept of like, uh, you know, progression as a way to move your personal story. I'm interested in your guys' thoughts on, on that. You know, honestly, that's one of the reasons why life, life is, or why I love life is feudal. Your own life is feudal. Your own has no guidance. It's very open world. Is there a story? There's no pre-constructed story. 
But even in the title, it's your own story, your own life. That's the point of it, is that you're progressing, you're building a community with your friends. That's where the story kind of takes shape. Like, Dump and I, we have our own server that we've been playing Life is Feudal Your Own on, and I love the the stories that we have for Dimension, how we're like, ah, oh, he's just standing in the shade like a supervisor. Like, that became a huge part of our roleplay community uh for that for that town and it was just something that we created based off of progression and the actions of others but if all you're doing is running around aimlessly trying to kill in 64 zombies you kind of lose that yeah and i mean it, it's good to have a story for progression uh but i still hold to the fact that progression should be a optimal thing um Progression should make my life easier on this on the game I'm playing or on the server I'm playing, not necessarily be forced to progress. And what I mean by that is like, you know, I shouldn't have to 100% be jumped from the Stone Age to Iron Age to actually survive and thrive in the game. Like that right. shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. Still a certain level of progression you have to reach to be OK. But I think a storyline progression is nice in video games because let's take, for example, uh, DayZ. Tell your own story, but there is still a story there you can read uh, from how the uh, like the ski loft area that was introduced in uh, update 1.12. Uh, there's a story there. You can see all the cars were bunched up like they were rushing to get out of there as fast as they can. You can see a bunch of other things. Um, you can see the carnivals and the um, you know you know little sh uh, festival areas. They were having a festival when this all hit. There are still little stories you can glean from it. Um, and, you know, even from other kind of games like Green Hell I've been playing, there's a story there, too. Do you need to follow the story? No, but it's there for you to learn about, for you to progress with. And uh, it's kind of cool. So I think that storyline progression in survival games has a good, important part to it to play to it, because it can actually give you a purpose when you run out of your own creative ideas to give you uh, a purpose. Exactly, right. exactly. And, and also to the point that Red made about how $9 million isn't a whole lot of money in the terms of game development, the one thing that will cause you to leak money like a sieve isn't, oh, they're buying lodges or yachts. It's not having a good project management team. Mm -hmm. Project man management teams are critical. Time and money. They manage that. They make sure that every team is doing something that facilitates their skills to the best of their ability, that every section of the game is being deployed in a timely fashion so that everybody's working and there's little time wasted. With bad leadership, you could have three weeks where no progress is being made, but that actually costs money. The manpower, you know, you think of the utilities of the place. There's a lot that goes into that. So, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, and I'm loving Absolutely. that picture of the legs. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and this <laughs> was to, to kind of uh, put put a uh, put a cherry on top of this little little Sunday. Um, that was the result of another player taking their pants off. And you can see it's the player on the oh my right. God, they have no legs. That's right. So the player <laughs> body parts don't show at this point. The shadow was just your clothes, not your body. And the shadow wasn't animated. Um, and then you you can see yeah. he took his pants off and then it just where they were floating in basically the character a pose up in the air. So if you take your shirt off, it does the same thing and you can't put it back yeah. on. So that was just kind of the comedic, just how bad it was. Uh, OK, that's, I have the perfect crazy. example for you folks of how bad the zombies faces were. If anybody's ever watched The Office and ever watched it when Dwight cut the face off a mannequin and put it on his own face. That's how detailed the faces looked. <laughs> oh, no. That's how bad it was. Um, imagine no hair. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, there's, yeah, a, there's a link imagine. in the chat. There's a link in the chat to that video if people want to check it out that haven't already. I get that's a chuckle awesome. out of it still. Uh, I had a lot of fun making it. So so that's my hot take. It ran a little long, but I thought it was uh, it was a pretty interesting topic. Oh, to that's cover. good. That's good to know, though, because for uh, I was even excited for De Dead Man or I was just sick and I felt this illness coming on. So I didn't jump on the bandwagon and I'm kind of glad I didn't. There's actually a PS to this. So there is a game that developers that had left the Dead Matter team several years ago have been working on their spare time called Vane. 
And it's actually pretty far along. It, it still doesn't have a full story, but as far as functional mechanics and graphics and uh, things like that, it's a it's a pretty fun little play. And it's currently free on the Steam Workshop. They're going to keep it free nice. until they get it to a point that they think it's worth people paying for it. See, and that goes back to project management, right? Because they're doing that in their spare time where the time they put into it is being properly used because they're passionate about it. Whereas this was their big project that they didn't manage a project correctly on and it's leagues behind. Yep. Oh, that's so frustrating. Yep, yep. So Vane, Vane, go check it out, definitely. And that's well, my Well, everyone, uh, <laughs> uh, before I hit my hot take, I just wanted to give everybody a little update on what I've been doing. I have been playing Starfield since uh, the early launch for anybody who got the premium edition. And I pretty much beat the game on my Xbox. Uh, so I started another playthrough on my channel where I've modded the game. So we've got about 60 mods running. So that's kind of what I've been focusing on. I was going to be doing more with it this weekend, but I became very ill. And Monday was bed rest day uh, as well as today. So uh, definitely we're going to be returning to our form um, tomorrow. There's no Dungeons Dragons because we have a play a special map being made by one of the players who's kind of critical. The storyline is no longer in the campaign. That should only be two or three weeks and then we should have that up. So tomorrow you could expect more Starfield. Uh, Thursday, definitely going to be touch a base with Dump to see if there's something that we could play together for uh, SOS research and just because I miss playing games with Dump. But my hot take is this. Every holiday season sees its fair share of full releases and early releases for many game genres. And this year in particular with 2023 and 2024, we're seeing a lot of survival um, early releases being talked about and games that are coming out. And I was just browsing some of the forums with Pacific Drive which I think is going to be an excellent game given what it is. But I noticed something. People compare the next survival game to be the next big one, the Daisy Killer, the Rust Killer. And I say that it does not have to be a Daisy Killer. It does not have to be a Rust Killer. So long as the game is challenging, entertaining, and has some depth and some immersion to it, a survival game can come in different shapes and forms. It doesn't have to be a game that is coming after Rust or DayZ for the title of the most consistently played survival games. Let them have their own identity. Let them have their own image. And don't compare them to games that don't make sense to compare them to. Instead, if you're interested in the game, purchase it, play it for what it is. And I think you'll have a lot more fun instead of walking into it with a negative mindset. And that's my hot take. That's actually really cool you say that y'all you know, because i know that we're supposed to be a survival game podcast and i can't say that we have the kind of rep that the game channel game rank ranks has but game ranks came out with a um by survival oh, 10 for survival games you need to look at in 2023 and one of those survival games was frostpunk 2 now if you folks don't know what frostpunk is you're, you're it's a game where you're trying to build a city in a frozen tundra and there's tons and tons of challenges but game racks is a huge channel millions of subscribers and that video got well over a million views and it's really interesting in our view my view personally to see how large of a breadth survival games truly have because when i started this podcast i actually didn't think that there was that large of a breadth of survival games Mind you, there was a lot of survival games out there that I knew were survival games, but as my knowledge expands, I can I now nowadays consider even RimWorld to be in a survival RimWorld, game. Yeah. Um, it is really interesting to look at that. So as we talk about these kind of game, uh, folks games, it's really cool to hear more about this from Jarl. Um, you know, I I may be caveman minded, but my idea of a survival game is resource scarcity and covering the basic needs of you your team, or even the population of people within your city. So you need to monitor their sleep, their health, their food, their water. You know, once you're going to that level of micromanagement, it is definitely a survival game. I wouldn't consider Crusader Kings 3 or Stellaris survival games, even though they feel similar to RimWorld. What isolates RimWorld from those is it's very much a survival game. You have to worry about the cold. You have to worry about the environment affecting the health and, and mental health of your people. So yeah, absolutely. Frostpunk, I I never really thought of Frostpunk as a survival game, but when you do look at it, it very much is. 
Same with those uh, mobile games from Walking Dead, where you're maintaining a, a community. Technically, you know, with a little more depth, even those could be survival games. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh oh. So, uh, Darkwing Tate says survival games have to have a food bar for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I agree. And they always have to have the key opponent. If you eat Darkwing Tate's meat, you get a food, food bar. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> they should also have um, a water bar. Because let me, let's admit it, that's the one thing that's hurting Sengoku Dynasty's early release. If it had the need for water, it would feel a little more like a survival game. It's, it's like uh, from Kung Fu Panda. I heard that this person can only survive on one uh, droplet of water. <laughs> <laughs> I get all the water from the corn dogs I eat. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, but moving on to my, my stuff, I'm getting a 2080 Ti. I'm really happy about it. I'm really excited for it. And that's all my news about me personally. Woohoo. Um, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, but getting serious, folks. Um, I'm actually calling on all content creators for survival games. Please share your content with us. Let us know about your clips, your videos, your live streams. And if you have stuff that you think is cool and want us to talk about what you're doing, go ahead and tag us at State of Survival Podcast on YouTube in your videos or on Twitter with a at SOS podcast. Um, or feel free to email us in State of Survival at a pod at gmail.com with the links to the content and live streams. Mind you folks, we will only be looking at um, uh, links and stuff to known platforms. So if you have a kind of, like for a better word, sketchy link, we're not going to be clicking on it. Please upload to a major platform, which we can trust and understand. I'm going to be throwing the thing, um, those uh, places you can link us to inside of chat, but also I'll be putting it down in the description because we would love to be able to talk to the people who are actually playing these games, see what their thoughts are about them, and really engage with the community more often than not. Because it's cool to watch us sit here and actually talk about these kind of games, but it's more interesting when we actually have feedback from the community itself about these games. Because every community is different. We look at Daisy's community, Rust community, Green Hell, Project Zomboid, The Long Dark. They all have their perks, cons, and even just similarities. So, that's my hot take. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Now let's get on to the main point that we have for today. So, surviving or thriving? A common term that Dump and I use all the time. Surviving, that insinuates the struggle, clawing your way through, problem solving, getting the resources you need. And if you don't have the proper resources, what kind of things on the fly can you do to try to get your hunger meter full? And then there's thriving when you're already sitting there with the top gear and you've got everything under your belt. In most survival games, the life you live is a combination of primitive survival techniques and making the scarce resources work in your favor. So my question for the guys here in the podcast are what are some aspects of survival games that could use a little luxury without breaking the game? I would honestly say that I think power is a luxury that won't break most games. And I'm not talking about pure electrical grid power. I'm talking about even mechanical power, water mills, windmills, uh, even basic pumps or, uh, you know, small little like pulleys and stuff. I think with the beauty and amazement of a lot of the game engines we have out nowadays for the populace and the majority of games that are made from them, there is so many cool things you can do with mechanical power. Like there's an upcoming survival game that I'm really excited for who actually really makes use of you actually building channels for water and moving a water wheel and stuff. And this stuff isn't necessarily 100% required for survival, but it really moves into the luxury where instead of sitting there for, you know, 30 minutes grinding your own grain, maybe you have a windmill you put the grain into and it grinds it for you and puts it in a nice little bucket, kind of like, you know, back in medieval ages. That's a luxury. That is freeing up your time. And that's what I consider a luxury in survival games. Something that takes away the grind of doing something re repeatedly and continuously and making it where you put it and you, you set it and forget it is kind of more or less what I say when I think of luxury. 
You know, I couldn't agree more. Uh, there's a good game out there called Vintage Story, which started off as a Minecraft mod and is now its own standalone kind of Minecraft clone. But you had to grind everything, every little resource that you could use for crafting. You have to go out and make yourself, even to the point of making cordage. And like you said, with the mill, what I love about that game is the mill streamlines so many things that you were spending hours doing before, but you still have to design the mill and make sure it works from the inside out. And I love that. I love that you can bring that type of automation, that type of power into your settlement without breaking the immersion or feeling like now that you have it, you're done with the game and the rest of the game is easy. So that's a very good point. What about you, Red? What's something that you think you'd like to see that would be considered luxurious that wouldn't break the game? Um, honestly, I think it's uh, I think it's some stuff that Dump Gra himself has has done some work on, and that's uh, really advanced crafting. So uh, with his metallurgy mod, um, with some of the stuff around, even the the leather masks were pretty fun. But it's that kind of it's really continuing on with the if you have a power system of some kind, whether it's mechanical or electrical, and then what can you do with it that that kind of advances the story and makes the game interesting where you could still go out and find bullets and and you know just loot them but how much more interesting to actually uh you know manufacture them yourself and go through the steps there absolutely yeah. i i think crafting is essential and that's kind of the backbone of today's theme um I kind of caught on that there was an update that released with the long dark this summer called uh, Frontier Comforts. And I started, the Frontier is what caught me off guard because I was seeing things that they introduced in that game, recipes, cookie recipes. I'm like, man, if I could eat that in Daisy, who we, I would be sitting on cloud nine, but we could, and there's a very good reason for it. But Let's start off with something basic. We've got our basic needs here, you know, clothing, shelter, water, uh, fire to cook, or fire could also represent power, like like Dumpgrau was saying, and then food. Uh, let's first touch up on clothing. Generally, when we think of survival games, we typically pick an apocalyptic setting, an emergency, or an accident that places an individual or individuals in a situation where they have to scrounge to survive. Now, typically clothing can be found in a pre-event war setting. For example, Day Z, you could find coats and pants that were left from before. But when I refer to scavenged textiles, many times when a game gives you this opportunity, it is really horrid looking and it looks horrifically patched together. It doesn't look very comfortable nor very functional, um, but in a setting where the world isn't going to get any better anytime soon, I find it odd that your character can't find a pair of scissors and utilize different materials to make something that looks good. What do you think, Dump? Why do you think that is? How would you handle clothing differently than a lot of survival games handle it? Clothing is a hard one because you also have to take into effect most people don't even know how to make proper clothing. Clothing would be very much an experimental state for a lot of people. I would go with kind of, if I had a post-apocalyptic setting, kind of where the world is still has ended recently and you're finding clothing, I would go the route of you're constantly cutting pieces of clothing up to make patchwork, uh, stitch work for the clothing you currently have. And... I would do kind of what I've always wanted to do with mods in other games, which is I would love to show every time I repair an object, there's more and more kind of what you said, where it doesn't look like it fits right, becomes more comfortable looking, it looks a little bit more ragged, and eventually just reach a state where that clothing is bad. However, I would also have a skill system. So it would reward players who constantly try to keep up like their best winter jacket or whatever, and try to keep it better, right? So maybe by the time they ran out of that winter jacket and maybe they had to find a new pair of pants or whatever, they had enough skill in tailoring to possibly find a pattern. And then once they learned that pattern, they knew how to make it um, again. And then maybe when they got up to higher levels, they didn't need a pattern. Because, I, I don't know, I, I dare anybody in chat to go and try without a pattern, without looking up any YouTube videos, to go and sell me a medium-sized shirt, just a basic t-shirt, 
with short sleeves or even no sleeves at all and make it fit well where it isn't awkward or cutting into you with your stitches and it doesn't fray within a week it's not as easy as most people think it that's a good point but i would actually argue the opposite based off of historical context you see um while our survivors survivalists may not be professional tailors most people who have settled on a frontier of anything or even had access to goods to craft workable clothing can at least make something that looks better than patchwork is it going to be a properly fitted t-shirt probably not but i could take a tarp and make a functional waterproof t-shirt that you could wear even stuff it with wool and still make it look somewhat good and my example of that is the american frontier um or even the a global depression like we've seen before a lot of people left their livelihoods and their homes because of job shortages to head west to see something on their own this is also during a time where women didn't always survive childbirth there were often times that men had to tailor their own outfits on the frontier with wool that they sheared from a sheep and learned how to work on their own. And uh, we have a picture up on the on the video right now for those who are listening. This is a group of men who went out on their own before their wives and children went out to cross the frontier to find stakes and then come back and get their family. And they made these clothing on their own but already this clothing looks a million times better than some of the survival clothing that we get in games and i'm not saying patched clothing doesn't have a place i would love like dump said if you repair your clothing it'd be cool to see the patchwork but let's evaluate these guys fashion they're oversized they're baggy they don't fit right they're probably not comfortable materials some of the poorer people even made vests out of burlap, you know, in the frontier era, which I couldn't even imagine. But these are two things that occurred not only in our own country, but worldwide, where people's lives were turned upside down, where the woman's job had to be shared by people who didn't typically do those jobs to manufacture those outfits, even if it was just for your family. Um, and it's it's interesting to see what happens when you take somebody out of their wheelhouse and say, okay, you need to make clothes, but there's still that night that need for luxury and appearance. <clears throat> oh, Darkwing Tate says, My grandma used to weave stuff. Took her so long to make anything. That's true, yeah. Actually, I bet you anything that the process would be terrible, especially if you're in a wagon. You know, how do we get this? A lot of times what people do is they find a torn fab shirt that they're wearing and they kind of just use it as a blueprint and, and, and cut around it and put it together. But the American pioneers didn't really buy clothing. They needed their money for other things. If they did buy clothing, it was something winter or something a little more durable. Um, but what do you think, Dump? The, the style is relatively simple, but from a technical standpoint, it's simple as well. But it definitely still looks kind of schnazzy um when i look at that image i see maybe they altered garments to fit themselves and maybe like i said maybe repaired it but i don't ever mind you back then they had a lot more like home home um home worker kind of training you know you had to do this stuff even when you weren't on the frontier stuff you know watching your wife do stuff i could probably could go and make a couple of my wife's earrings even though i've never touched it i've seen the practice happen so being able to repeat it would be kind of difficult but i could probably remember how to do it but this kind of clothing looks like uh that they came across with this uh maybe they had a couple of sets and they've just repaired it or maybe they picked it off of their fellow uh buddies dead bodies came across a body in a river or whatever but Honestly, in I don't know, uh, out in a post-apocalyptic world, I could see this being a thing. But if you're talking about literally starting off from the Stone Age, uh, this would only, in my opinion, come around when people have like a Dark Mean Tate said a loom and other things. And, oh uh, right, that would take Absolutely. a while to get to. Because the so, thing yes, is, I think it's possible. Oh, <laughs> I was just gonna throw in. So I remember back when I was in junior high, which I think was around the time this photo was taken. Yeah, probably like two years um, after. 
we uh, in in home ec, we made a shirt, we made a backpack, we made a coat. Um, now it was from an established pattern, but and Lord knows I couldn't remember now how to do it. But uh, it's achievable, I think. Uh, I think getting it so that getting the material is probably the hardest thing. Yeah, believe it or not, those black jackets that you see is rabbit. And in fact, if you watch the show alone, there's a couple people who make rabbit shirts the same way. And what they do is they they stretch out the skin, they cut it into strips, but they don't slice it into individual strips. They cut one strip off and then switch the cutting style until they get a long strip, then let it dry. And then they wind it up to make cordage. You know, in any survival, okay. whether it's post-apocalyptic or anything, making cordage is a key skill. So if you could set up a trap then you can hunt these rabbits, put them into strips. And that is actually a rabbit skin jacket. Um, the A lot of times when you see their vests and such, what did they use for material? You're right, maybe it's canvas from their wagon. Maybe it's something else. But there were a lot of times where if you're in a survival setting and you have to worry about making winter clothes, your first set might be booty. And I agree in the caveman, you know, you're talking about Stone Age, making your own set is kind of going to be an achievement in itself but even the poorest people in the medieval ages still had matching tunics and stuff that they made with their bare hands and a lot of the times it wasn't always skilled workers who did it which is remarkable i don't know if you've ever seen those hand looms but it's like a weird spindle that you would put wool around and it was like a rake you would rake the wool and then create your twine with it and continue to rake the wool and then pull it back and make your own cordage with it. Of course, those are tools that you would have to have ahead of time, but it was very much something. Uh, even mountain men, when they made their own leather jackets and it was something they made and then added to over the years, they still looked leagues better than some games. No. I think you both made some really good points here, and it's really cool to hear about the rabbit skin thing. I will leave with this, and it's me being a little bit cheeky. I think that if you took any generation of maybe Boomer and back, they could do this. You take my generation and forward, they may have some difficulties. And that's where I have to combat you and say, I don't think so. Whereas Boomers were taught to do this in home ec and stuff, the Millennials and Gen Z are the Etsy generation. They've been making cosplay stuff out of scrap and they're not even trained. And some of the cosplays look just like the video game props. They're self-trained. You know, yeah, they spend a lot of time in it, but the world is over. You have to be able to make your own clothes in your own, in your own boots. Uh, I would actually say that the biggest downfall is our next, our newest generations don't have to make the stuff that they make. They don't have to make their own clothes or they don't have to hand make a cosplay if they can just go and buy the things from the Bethesda. I'm gonna buy a laser gun from Fallout. Hey, look guys, what, what do I have? But there are people who are taking PVC pipes that aren't engineers and they're just, they're just messing around and learning as they go. And you have to realize going from the East Coast to the West Coast, that was almost a year long trip. So by the time you got to the West, you knew how to make a sock. It may not be a comfortable sock and your socks may not even match, but <laughs> it is interesting to see. So that's a good example of luxury versus barely surviving. This is thriving, whereas surviving would be tarps stapled to each other. <laughs> so next up, we got food. Food is really big, I think, in any survival game. And... Uh, this topic is an important one for me. As somebody who writes his own homebrew RPGs, I think of Tolkien when I think of it, uh, where it's, he said, um, and I'm going to read the quote because it's a good one. If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. I don't think that just because the world would end, you would be bound to eating canned food and whatever you found laying on the ground. I think at some point, somebody's going to want to make something out of it. Yeah, I think so. Um, there is a great, uh, I'm not sure if anybody's ever seen it. There was a documentary on Netflix a while ago called Beer Saved the World. And it was about how uh, people who were just uh, scavengers and uh, hunters um, found a puddle that had been essentially fermenting wheat inside of it. They believe that some of the earliest forms of liquor is actually what made people want to settle down and actually try 
to grow slash reproduce what they had found previously. Um, because you can see all sorts of different ways of making alcoholic or some sort of happier kind of drug giving substances out there. Mind you, they're not illegal drug substances. These are just like liquor and other kind of things that make you feel better about yourself. Because remember, hunting and gathering was a very kind of, for lack of a better word, bleak existence. You were constantly moving. You were constantly having to find new food and sources. So when people started to realize that this plant made this good feeling stuff, maybe I could find ways to mass produce this. And what I ended up doing is in their efforts to harvest like large quantities of wheat to put in water to reproduce what they found, they ended up stumbling upon how to cross pollinate or to create their own like kind of self-made uh, fields of wheat. And this kind of struck upon the agricultural era, which kind of led to all the cool food combinations we have now. Like, I don't know how somebody came up with a great idea that I'm going to take this green plant and I'm going to add it to this piece of meat and make it taste better. Or some of the other crazy things you see out there where like lard by itself is not a very tasteful thing. Like I personally, I believe we thought we, we used the lard for making candles long before we ever thought to use mm -hmm. it as an, ad an addition to making things taste better. No, you're absolutely right. And it, the earliest forms of this can be seen in the Middle East and the Mediterranean, where they use spices to change the flavor of their food. In fact, spices were some of the most expensive things you could trade. And I get a lot of people are like, why wine? Why wine in the desert? Why do why does Egypt and all these Mediterranean countries bottle wine? Do you know how long wine lasts? It's an incredibly long amount of time. In fact, they cracked open a sealed container in the Mediterranean uh, on a YouTube video that was 1500 years old. The wine was still good. It did lose its flavor. It did lose its potency because the ideal mark is between 50 and 100 years. But people didn't drink wine back then to get drunk. They drank wine because there was not a whole lot of water. <laughs> and it's funny to see they, they invented this process of using wine to cook with and using wine to wind it because of a necessity you know it came out of survival and i love the idea that survival games give us the dried meat smoked meat boiled meat whatever you could find in a, a can some games even daisy has the ability to grow food and you can make zucchinis and plants like that but i i find it sad that a lot of games don't kind of tap into some of the realistic ramifications of using just canned food uh, on the YouTube channel, Good Mythical Morning, they have a segment where they eat aged food products, some of them from the 80s, some of them all the way from the early 1900s. And it is shocking how some canned foods last the test of time, and some canned foods can't even make it 20 years without going bad. So, um, and you could actually, I'm going to go ahead and post this video. Uh, this is a very extreme version of it. But you could tell that they're tasting these canned foods that range between 20 and 100 years old and their reactions to it. But some of the foods, like the the peanut butter that was from the Korean War, still tasted just like peanut butter. So, so there is validity to using canned foods to survive. But at the same time, uh, it's not going to be sustainable because at some point, these canned foods are going to start to turn. Um, the other point I'd like to make is in the Great Depression, people adapted to find dessert recipes uh, because sometimes they had to find stuff in their cabinet to make a dessert. Sugar was one of the most expensive things on the market at that time, sugar and molasses, um, especially after the Great Boston Molasses Incident. But they used other ingredients in their cabinet to create these foods, uh, which brings up one of my favorite YouTubers to watch, Dylan Hollis. He makes several of these recipes on his channel from a Great Depression cookbook. And he's shocked at how many of them are actually better than the desserts we get today, even though uh, it's not exactly sugary or, or what we would typically deem as a sweet. And I'll go ahead and post that video because in this video, he makes some um, leftover bread pancakes. And you could use the most stale bread you have and still make pancakes with these things. And it's fantastic. It's from 1947. So it's at a time during, you know, the World War II where they had some shortages. And it's really remarkable to see some of the things that they tapped into. And the Long Dark kind of did this with their newest expansion, Frontier Comforts. 
Uh, it released a skillet and recipes that are more luxurious than you would expect in a typical survival game. Um, what I'll do is I'll go through the list and I'll explain what ingredients go into it. And then Dump, I want to hear if you have any ideas on what we could do to say day Z to kind of spice up the palate. So the recipes they've added was uh, coastal fish cakes, which is just basic fish cakes, you know, breading fish, super easy to make. Stalker's pie, which is a pie made with acorn flour, which is really good replacement for flour in case you're ever short. Oil, salt, water, bear and wolf meat, and some filling to make like a gravy. Lily's pancakes, which is maple syrup. That's something that's been made for hundreds of years and will continue to be one of the easiest things that you could make. Peaches, acorn grounds, oil, and water. Briar House Pie, it's a stodgy dish made of rabbit, um, ptarmigan, uh, venison, oil, and flour. And although not the tastiest meal, the cool thing about this is you get the rabbit, which gives you fat, the venison, which gives you protein. It's kind of like a good meat pie that gives you all the calories you need for survival. They also introduced the Tam Thompson family stew. Um, stews aren't necessarily new to the survival genre, but ingredients include corn, carrots, potatoes, mushrooms, flour, broth, and, and cooking soul flour. So it's nice to see that it is it, elaborate recipe as well. Camber flight porridge, oats, water, maple syrup, rose hips, and peaches. And rose hips are berries that we see all the time here in the Pacific Northwest. Dock workers pie, which is a fish pie made with two different kinds of fish, oil, salt, potatoes, and water. Ranger stew, a gravy stew with harvested meats, broth, potato, carrot, and flour. And then the prepper's pie, which is a portable pie that you can eat like a, a calzone and it's mushrooms, acorn flour, water, oil, and salt. If you could come up with a couple recipes that you could potentially make in Daisy with what's available, what, what would it be? Uh, stir fry, uh, stuffed oh. vegetables, um, it, a, uh, Maybe make a sort of like in this one a stew. We already have the pot. We already have the skillet. Uh, all we would have to do is throw in a couple of chunks of meat uh, in there, a couple of vegetables, <laughs> blah, blah blah. Bob's your uncle. Um, you know, even stuffing meat itself, cutting a slit, stuffing stuff into it, baking it. Boom! A more elegant yet very simple meal to make. Um, even uh, I would say even. Um, uh, but even making uh, desserts using uh, the sugar that you would get by grilling uh, different types of vegetables like bell pepper, maybe uh, if they introduce corn or kind of stuff to make kind of a sweet tasting thing and make a little bit of sweets. But yeah, so uh, I think that's the kind of stuff I would do. I love that. I love that. And it just gives a little more. I mean, if you're thriving out there. You don't have to eat like a peasant, right? <laughs> and then that brings us to lodging. A lot of times when you see these survival games, um, it's the most simplistic lodging at first. You know, of course, storage containers, things that you can gather to to shore you up. But if you're going to be out there for a while, you might as well actually build a home. And I'm glad to see that there are more games like that introducing this kind of system. Sons of the Forest is one of them. Uh, but there, there's definitely a chance to build, even decorate a base. But in these games, it looks like the structures are made carelessly, uh, where form over comfort is often place taking forefront. Yet there's more to survival than just lifting yourself off the cold, bug-infested ground. Sleep and mental health is incredibly important. And even the pioneers had some nicer accommodations than we see in some common games, as well as, if you watch the show alone, some of the things that they achieve. Um, you could even use anything from medieval technology to modern day know-how. And if there are sheep in the game, you could shear them for cushioned wool. If there's bamboo, then you can make some elaborate frames. And of course, hammocks are also a viable, safe, and comfortable option when supplies are scarce. And I know in a multiplayer game, asking players to sleep could be frustrating. So beds aren't really on the forefront sleep. of everybody's mind. Sleep, go to sleep. The whole server, go to sleep so we could pass the day but what i always thought would be nice is bed rest how many times have you been sick or injured in day z and you're running around praying you find medicine and praying you don't die from it how nice would it be if you 
found a bed to rest in for 10 minutes while your buddies are protecting you, and it reduces the time that you recover from your illness. Yeah, it's called death. <laughs> <laughs> the endless <laughs> <laughs> Oh, bud, I'm struggling here. You need some bed rest. <laughs> I okay. love that. I love that. Oh. But we see this also in the fiction Swiss Family Robinson. You know, their treehouse seems really elaborate. But one of the things that the Disney developers were told when they were building the house is they wanted it to look like it was built from scrap from a boat. So they could only build the actual structure from things that you would find on a ship because they were shipwrecked. And I just love the beauty of it. Um, they have multiple buildings for privacy, which I think would be unique. They're utilizing a tree, which don't expect that. That's crazy. I don't think I'd ever make a tree house that elaborate, but it gets them off the ground. And, you know, they really kind of thought about beauty as well as function. It was a little corny to see like mom go, we need to spruce this place up. And then that that's kind of the nature of their structure. But there's a lot of function here that we can appreciate as survivalists as well. And of course, Definitely. I didn't forget about you, Dump. Heat. Mm -hmm. A stone fireplace. All you need is clay and stone. And again, I've said it, I love the show alone. Uh, in this picture we're about to show is a couple that went out on the season where there were two people uh, involved. They started apart and had to meet each other. And they built a log cabin with a functioning fireplace. And if it wasn't for the scarcity of food, they would have been able to stay there a lot longer. A true love story. They found each other and survived. <laughs> Dump, would you find me? Would you build me a log cabin? No. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, at least you'll make my knives. <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's a lot of people in Alone who try to debate, okay, if food is plentiful, let's spend our calories building a nice place. If it's not plentiful, then don't waste your calories like these folks did. They wasted their calories to build a nice place, but there wasn't enough food to kind of replenish that battery. I'd like to see games kind of incorporate something like this a little more. Uh, like in Sons of Forest, you could build a fireplace in your cabin. It's it's little things, but I don't see why in a zombie post-apocalypse you can't build a clay and stone fireplace and add just a little bit of comfort to your home living. Good. I think it's <laughs> all about, uh, like, when it comes to eating properly, it's all about moderation. Yeah. It really is, because a lot of people, there was a guy on alone who hunted a moose, killed a moose, and ate the moose. But there's not enough moose fat in a moose to sustain you. Uh, it is part of the deer family. It's very lean. And he ended up starving to death without starving to death, because he didn't moderate how much moose he was eating versus anything else. But we've got passive water collection that we I'd like to see in games. That would be cool, whether it's a giant plastic container on the house or some other form of passive water collection. And uh, what, what do you think about features that you'd like to see to games that could help base building and at least make it a little more luxurious, if not more functional? I just love to see more living off the land kind of things. I'm not talking about just farming. I'm talking about truly working to rebuild civilization or the creature comforts of civilization. Um, I think a lot of survival games miss this effort, and a lot of survival games don't reward people when they do introduce it. Sitting by a fireplace is definitely a very heartwarming and loving experience. Having a warm meal in your belly is definitely very different than eating a cold meal every day. Having the ability to brew coffee or tea or other things is very important. Even going back to clothing, having properly fitted clothing or even nice looking clothing can make someone feel better. Remember, folks, even in this world, we all suffer from different mental health diseases across the board. And I myself suffer from depression. I can't imagine what it would be like living in an apocalypse with depression and not feeling like I could actually get anything done. So having these creature comforts could easily be played into like mental statuses and stuff inside of games. Obviously, I wouldn't suggest putting depression inside of a game, but you know what I mean. Yeah, no, it's absolutely right. Well, before we take a look at a question that we posed to the community, let's check in with our field reporter and see how the life of luxury has been treating them.
Who do you think right it's going to be? <laughs> do, you, do you think it's going to be Earl or Dave? Hey, Dave. Oh, no. I mean, hey, Dave. My man, Dave. How's it going? Uh, Dave, you've been you've been living the life of luxury. Why don't you tell us how that's been? How have you been enjoying your sweeter food? I think that's a good sign. Uh, he sounds full. Oh, he does. What's your favorite kind of dessert? The slow kind. Dave oh, man. Knows. You know what, Dave? Why don't you just go away? Go away. I, I don't Kill like your attitude video. today. Kill the video. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I swear, Dump, normally I'm the one that's got a problem with Dave, but you, you shoot him away pretty darn quick. Well, well since we're know. not going to hear from Dave, we did ask the community. Um, <laughs> survival games are set out to challenge you as a player and your ability to perform and solve problems with resources that are scarce. What do you think surviving versus thriving looks like to you? What does thriving look like to our community? And Dump, if you could take any setting, what does thriving look like to you if you consider yourself thriving in a survival game? If I consider myself thriving in a survival game, it means that I have a warm place to place my head and I know that there is food waiting for me to eat at the end of the night. Nice. What about you, Red? What, what kind of makes it like when you're like, I'm thriving, what does that look like for you? Imagine if you will warlord big comfy <laughs> throne lots of minions um all i do is chop off a few heads here and there and keep the peace Boom. oh my god you sound like lord farquater genghis khan i i'm immediately <laughs> i'm immediately getting marco polo vibes from that show on netflix because i love the set design of that place comfortable furs everywhere huge throne okay Okay, fair enough. I think That's thriving right. for me would n be never having to worry about ripping a hole in my pants as being life threatening <laughs> or never trying to determine who's getting the last can of peaches and just some bread. Honestly, bread in a post apocalypse, that would, the smell of it cooking, I think bread would be so amazing. If I could just make some bread, I'd be happy. <laughs> nice. But with that being said, we've already gone over our visions of what thriving and surviving look like as we discuss shelter, clothing, food, and resources. But uh, what are we doing next week, Dump? Well, next week, folks, we got an awful good treat for you. Next week is going to be Hell Kiana from Daisy Mining, and we're going to be actually talking to her about her efforts in time making her own survival game she did a little while ago. Folks, I hope you guys are excited because on October 10th, Helkion is coming here. And I'm very happy for all of you folks being here. Remember, folks, to give us a subscribe. And I appreciate everyone coming here. Have a wonderful day and or night. See you then. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>